Mr. President. Senator from Georgia. Mr. President, I want to rise in opposition to the three amendments that we're going to be voting on today. And I want to start with the Leahy Amendment just uh, referred to by the Senator from Illinois. Uh, Senator Leahy's amendment will act as a complete substitute to the bill that's on the floor. And if passed, it will require a conference with the House of Representatives. And, you know, here we are on the 27th of December. The House is not coming back until the 30th. There simply is not time, even if the amendment was substantive enough that it ought to be considered for passage, to get that conference with the House and get this bill on the desk of the President by December 31, which is when these provisions expire. The first change that the Leahy Amendment makes is to reduce the extension uh, sunset from December 31, 2017 back to December 1, 2005. Now that date coincides with the expiration of certain other FISA provisions, uh, namely the roving wiretap authority, the business records court orders, and the lone wolf. Now it may seem like that ought to make sense that you have all of these expiring at that time, but frankly, having been involved in the intelligence community for the last uh, 12 years now, it actually works in reverse from that, and it would have a negative influence on the, on the community itself. Because if you match the FAA sunset with the Patriot and the um, uh, ERPTA sunsets, it provides no real benefit to congressional oversight and could actually increase the risk that all of these authorities will expire at the same time. And if they all expired at the same time, the community would certainly be in a real disadvantaged position from an operational standpoint. The Leahy Amendment also makes a number of modifications to the executive branch oversight provisions that I believe simply are not necessary. For example, the amendment will require the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, ICIG, to conduct a mandatory review of U.S. person privacy rights in the context of the FISA Amendments Act implementation. Now, if we really believe that this sort of review by the ICIG is necessary, we don't need a statutory provision. We can simply get a letter from the Intelligence Com Committee directing that that be done, and it will be done. So trying to think that we need a statutory provision on that type of issue, if it does, if there's any contemplation that it exists, is simply not necessary. I'm also concerned that the Leahy substitute incorrectly elevates the ICIG to the same level as the Attorney General and the Director of National Intelligence by adding the ICIG as a recipient of FISA Amendments Act reviews that are conducted by the DOG, uh, DOJ IG and other intelligence community element inspectors general. That really doesn't make a lot of sense because the Attorney General and the DNI are the only ones responsible for jointly authorizing the collection of foreign intelligence information under the FAA. They are the ones who need to review compliance assessments conducted by the relevant IGs, including those conducted by the ICIG. If there's concern about whether the ICIG can even conduct these types of reviews, then I think the FAA is clear on that point. Since the ODNI is authorized to acquire or receive foreign intelligence information, the ICIG can conduct these reviews to the same extent as any other inspector general of an element of the intelligence community. He doesn't need redundant statutory authorization. It's important to understand that the word, and I quote, acquire, as used here, doesn't mean acquisition in the actual physical collection of foreign intelligence information. Rather, acquire here simply means to come into possession or control of, often by unspecified means. We know this because in the annual review provision, in the very next paragraph sought to be amended, the FAA uses the more precise conducting and acquisition terminology, which clearly indicates that it affects only those elements that are actually collecting foreign intelligence information. This same annual review provision would also be modified by Section 4 of Senator Leahy's amendment. 
His changes would expand the agency heads responsible for conducting these annual reviews to any agency with targeting or minimization procedures as opposed to the current law, which applies to only those agencies that are actually responsible for conducting an acquisition, that is, the physical collection of foreign intelligence information. Right now, any IC element that receives downstream FISA collection must comply with FISA's retention, dissemination, and use limitations. They don't have any kind of blanket authority to use this information. But the elements required in the annual reviews are geared more toward the actual collectors of the foreign intelligence information than they are to downstream IC elements that are already required to comply with FISA's FISA's retention, dissemination, and use limitations. The Intelligence Committee has been conducting oversight on this collection program long before it was ever codified in the FISA Amendments Act. We've worked closely with the Judiciary Committee to carefully monitor the implementation of the FAA authorities by the executive branch. In the end, I'm fully satisfied that the FAA is working exactly as intended and in a manner that protects our rights as Americans. As I've just explained, I do not believe that Senator Leahy's proposed changes are necessary, nor do I believe they improve upon the current practice. And I want to just quickly address what uh, the Senator from Illinois said about the collection on U.S. persons. I mean, if you're, if you're collecting on someone who is in Pakistan and they call somebody in the United States, he may be a U.S. citizen or he may be uh, a non-U.S. citizen, and if you're collecting on him under a proper court order, there can be, at times, um, collection on somebody inside the United States. But the FISA Amendments Act makes, uh, uh, um, a has a provision for dealing with that so that we have what we call minimization provisions in place that immediately do not allow the use of any information collected on a U.S. citizen in an unlawful manner. The FISA court is very tough. They're very strict. And they don't just grant an authority to allow our intelligence community to gather information on foreign suspects or um, uh, foreign entities or somebody who is working for a foreign power in, in any kind of um, household um, uh, manner. It, they are very strict in their requirements of what must be shown in order to be able to collect that. So in the rare times that there is a U.S. citizen on the other end of the line, the minimization provisions kick in, and they worked. They worked very well. And the Leahy substitute simply will not allow the community to do the job that we need to get done. Secondly, I want to address the Merkley Amendment. Again, I oppose this amendment. When Congress created the FISA court back in 1978, uh, it was understood that this court would have to operate behind closed doors given the sensitivity of the national security matters that the court considers. Each time FISA has been amended, whether it's Section 501 dealing with business records or 702 relating to targeting foreign terrorists overseas, Congress has maintained the same high level of protection for the court's decisions. And what the Merkley Amendment would do would be to make those decisions public. Section 601 of FISA already requires the Attorney General to provide copies of all decisions, orders, or opinions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court or Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court of Review that includes significant construction or interpretations of the provisions of the entire act. So there are some reporting requirements right now that are in place. The Merkley Amendment would further require the Attorney General to declassify and make available to the public any of those decisions that relate to Section 501 business record court orders or Section 702 overseas targeting provisions. I believe the American people understand that there are certain matters that simply do not need to be made public, particularly when it comes to dealing with bad guys around the world. 
men who get up every morning and think about ways that they can kill and harm Americans. And our folks in the intelligence community are doing a darn good job of gathering information on those types of individuals. And those are not the type of FISA court orders uh, for given by the court to gather that information that ought to be made public. In matters concerning the FISA court, the Congressional Intelligence and Judiciary Committee serve as the eyes and ears of the American people through this oversight, which includes being given all significant decisions, orders, and opinions of the court, we can ensure that the laws are being applied and implemented as Congress intended. If a significant FISA court decision raises concerns, the Intelligence and Judiciary Committees will ask questions, and we have done that from time to time. We hold hearings, we get briefings, we receive notifications and semi-annual reports all designed to give Congress good insight into the real-life applications and interpretations of the FISA Act. This amendment does nothing to advance that oversight, but it could cause real operational problems. If we put in the public domain declassified opinions or unclassified summaries of the most significant court orders, we would give our enemies a roadmap into our collection priorities and capabilities. Now, I know that one of the responses is going to be that the specific intelligence sources and methods could be redacted, but that only solves part of the problem. These guys we're dealing with, these bad guys around the world are smart guys. They are not idiots. And they know that when they look at a declassified piece of intelligence information that has redacted uh, portions of it, they are able to piece the puzzle back together again and figure out exactly who those sources are and what their methods are, which is going to put our intelligence community uh, gatherers in jeopardy from a national security standpoint. There's already substantial oversight of Sections 501 and 702 by the FISA Court, the Department of Justice, the intelligence community, and the Congress. And I can't think of any two provisions in FISA that have received more attention and more scrutiny than Sections 501 and 702. And yet, as a result of this vigorous oversight, we also know that these sections are two of the most carefully implemented by all of our investigative authorities. This amendment sets a dangerous precedent and would undermine some of our most sensitive investigations and investigative techniques. Passing it would also impede our chances of getting a clean FAA extension to the President, as I had mentioned earlier in my comments. Lastly, I want to quickly mention the Paul Amendment. Again, I'm going to oppose this amendment because it is inconsistent with the Constitution and it contradicts decades of established Supreme Court precedent and federal law. Contrary to what this amendment says, there is no Fourth Amendment violation when the government gets information from a third party about a person who has voluntarily given that information to the third party. And what the Paul Amendment would do, it would limit the ability of our intelligence community and our prosecutors to take information that a bad guy has given to a third party, and we get that information from the third party, from that information being used in a prosecution against that bad guy. In U.S. v. Miller, a 1976 Supreme Court case, the court stated, and I quote, that it has repeatedly held that the Fourth Amendment does not prohibit the obtaining of information revealed to a third party and conveyed by him to government authorities, even if the information is revealed on the assumption that it will be used only for a limited purpose and the confidence placed in the third party will not be betrayed. Uh, betrayed clearly, directly, language directly contrary to the Paul Amendment. The Paul Amendment says that the government would always have to either have consent or a search warrant to get information held by a third party in a system of records. Now, this amendment is, would have a significant impact not just on criminal cases, from drugs to violent crime to child offenses, but on national security matters. Often, the information obtained from a system of records, as described in this amendment, is what we call building block information. 
It's the basic information that the law enforcement and intelligence communities use to build an investigation long before there may be probable cause. This type of information can be used not just to build cases, but to rule out people as suspects. In short, ensuring that they won't be subjected to more intrusive investigative measures like search warrants. Yet this amendment elevates building block information in the hands of a third party to the equivalent of privately held information in which there is reasonable expectation of privacy. Even though a person voluntarily hands over information to a third party, this amendment says that we should put the genie back in the bottle and now create a reasonable expectation of privacy. What's more, if the government gets information from a third party without consent or a search warrant, this amendment says it can never be used in a criminal prosecution. The message here to banks, hotels, shipping companies, fertilizer stores, you name it, don't bother being good Samaritans and give law enforcement tips about suspicious activities. We'll just take our chances and hope we get enough probable cause in time to stop whatever crime or terrorist act may be planned. Simply stated, um, this amendment is contrary to case law and contrary to constitutional provisions, and I would urge all of my colleagues to vote against this amendment, the Merkley Amendment, as well as the Leahy Amendment when we begin voting at 530. Mr. President.